Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, before we get started on the talk, I wanted to give you a little background about myself. Not only because I like to talk about myself, but because my background and how I came to be interested in this field, I think has great relevance for you. My main occupation in life is not as a writer of books or running a personal training facility or in the exercise field at all. I ended up in medical school largely triggered by interests um, in Arthur Jones and everything that he wrote. But my occupation is I am an emergency physician. And the bulk of what I do is um, critical care and resuscitation. So that means your gunshot wounds, your stab wounds, um, your blunt trauma from vehicular accidents, but also what I see are the end stage manifestations of the diseases of modern civilization. And there's a saying in my specialty that what you do matters. Because every day you go to work, you have a real opportunity that you are probably going to save someone's life. Someone will come to you either dead or close to it, and you will make interventions that are going to um, change that for them. But the thing that I start to realize over time is that when I do save someone's life, largely what happens is they go out of the emergency department, they go upstairs into the intensive care unit, they live for six or eight more days, and about a million dollars is spent on their care, and then they do die. As opposed to what happens in my personal training facility, where you get clients that have not yet become ill or are in the earlier stages of the diseases of modern civilization. And we very commonly see elderly people discard their walkers and their canes. We see patients with Parkinson's disease, barely functional, that now go on cruises and vacations and hikes. Um, we see people with adult onset or type 2 diabetes within 12, 16 weeks of their training having to go off their oral hypoglycemic medication because they no longer need it. And what I want to do by talking about myself in this way is to talk about you guys to make you understand that what you do really matters because you're saving lives on the front end and you're not only saving life, you're saving quality of life because when you do it, they don't go in the intensive care unit, spend a million dollars and die anyway. This is a very profound thing, and for the type of facilities that Werner and Gabby run, I think as we go forward in the future and as more literature is accumulated by the presenters at this conference, not myself included, I'm just a tinkerer, what we're going to find is that this is the most profound public health initiative that we can be taking. Um, in my talk, I want to speak to you about some, a conclusion I've come to about um, high intensity strength training and how it relates to volume of physical activity and health in general. And it's a theory I have, and like most theories, I have come to it um, by the aggressive defense of a theory that was wrong. And I'm going to take you through my journey as a practitioner of high intensity training to tell you how I got to this conclusion. So this is me at about age 15. I got interested in strength training because I was a bicycle racer in the then early sport of bicycle motocross, which is a sprint sport where you're 45 second lap and you're going over jumps and obstacles and things of that nature. When I first started it, I was not very good, but um, I entertained the idea of taking up strength training to try to improve my performance. And I used an old leftover barbell set, the type that had the plastic over the cement case, and I came with a little manual in it, and I followed that manual, and I did it the magical three days a week. Um, but only one set for exercise because um, I couldn't be bothered to read that deeply into the manual. 
but the effect that it had on my sporting performance was astounding. At the time this picture I was, was taken, I was probably somewhere between 15 and 16 years of age, and at the time this picture was taken at a, a national competition, I had been undefeated for a solid year. And during that interim between age 15 and 16, I was out doing some wind sprints and ran into a gentleman um, who was middle-aged but looked very impressive in terms of his physical demeanor and musculature, and I spoke to him. And it turned out that he had opened a new gym in the area. It was a Nautilus gym. It was a very new concept. And I spoke to him, and the, the membership was very much out of my budget. So I negotiated with him to give janitorial services in exchange for a membership. And one day while cleaning off his desk, I found this very primitive looking bulletin sitting on top of his desk and picked it up and started flipping through it. And he walked into the office and he said, oh, I was given several of these when I bought the equipment. You can take it home with you. And this was the first book that I ever read cover to cover in one sitting. And Thoreau once said, how many a man can mark a change in his life by the reading of a book? And I am one of those men. That book changed my life forever. Um, and I started training at the Nautilus facility using Nautilus training principles. And if I thought that strength training had an effect on my sport for me, it paled in comparison to what this did. It catapulted me from a local expert level into a national professional level. This is a photo taken of me probably somewhere between the ages of 17 and 18 when I was a professional racer. I was making um, very good money. I had national sponsorship, and I owed it all to high-intensity strength training. Also during this time, by this point, we're talking about 19, between 1977 and 1980 time frame, um, Mike Mincer was becoming a very big deal in the bodybuilding world, and because he embraced the principles of Arthur Jones, I very much embraced Mike Mincer. Um, and he wrote a lot about uh, intensity extending techniques um, and moving up the ladder of intensity, and I took that very much to heart. And over time, it turned out that my savior became my tormentor. Um, I still maintained the magical trinity of three days a week, regardless of the intensity extenders, and regardless of the fact that I really had become much stronger, and as such, could bring a lot more punishment to myself. I had not yet figured out um, the recovery side of the equation. And this photo was taken, I was probably a freshman or sophomore in college by this point, and had a lot more training under my belt, but at this point my training was actually starting to hurt me. I had athletes that I thought were not as dedicated as I was, and not as well conditioned as I was, now starting to beat me, and a sport becomes much less fun when you are not winning, I discovered. Um, but nonetheless, I continued the sport until I started medical school and became too busy to carry on, and I still continued to win and make money, and largely that paid for college and um, got me started in medical school. Um, but I persisted with this type of training and this volume of training for over a decade. I just kept, you know, when it didn't work, I just doubled down. I did more, I did harder. I never contemplated that maybe backing off a little bit or maybe decreasing my volume would be the answer. So I just kept doing it until in 19, I guess, 94, 95, perhaps it was 96, I can't remember exactly, but Ellington Darden came out with a, a monograph, a small pamphlet that you could purchase through one of the muscle magazines um, called Upside Down Bodybuilding. And his concept was, we're gonna take everything that's popular knowledge about strength training and bodybuilding, we're gonna turn it on its head. 
It's going to be briefer instead of more frequent. Um, it's going to have an, an, a concept of starting out by getting lean first and then bulking up. Everything was completely the opposite, but it, the program itself had a significant reduction in the volume of work that was being done. Um, as I recall, most of the routines had eight or fewer exercises. And they were performed um, initially three days a week, but then it would quickly ratchet back to once every fifth day and then twice a week. I'm sorry, twice a week and then once every fifth day. Um, and during the period of the upside down bodybuilding, um, I became interested in super slow because several of the routines that were in this pamphlet were based on super slow, which was a training protocol um, invented by Ken Hutchins, who was a um, employee of Arthur that was involved in the original osteoporosis project. Um, and the idea there was force is mass times acceleration. We're training elderly women with very frail bones. So we want to control force, and we will do that by using a movement speed that eliminates the acceleration side of that equation as much as possible. And it produced very good results, not only for the training subjects, but for more typical athletes that used it as well. When I did the upside down bodybuilding pamphlet, this was the first break in a decade long stalemate. I thought I had simply reached any genetic potential I might have, and that was it. But I felt as if the routines that made the most impact on me were the ones that involved the super slow. So I ordered the super slow technical manual from Ken Hutchins, and this is my uh, very well-worn cover of the book that I purchased from him. But I also read cover to cover in one sitting. And to say that I took a deep dive into super slow is an understatement. Um, I became very deeply interested in it. Now, for those of you not familiar with the super slow training protocol and the super slow movement as it existed in the 1990s, um, Ken Hutchins created a subculture of devotees that was very intense. They called it the Branch Davidians of high intensity exercise. Um, and Ken, was given a book um, by Arthur Jones, a book from Arthur Jones that he gave to him, a book called The True Believer by Eric Hoffer, who was a 20th century philosopher that discussed the psychology of mass movements. And one of the main tenets was that in a mass movement, you not only have to have a god, but the absolute requirement is you must have a devil. And Ken Hutchins' devil was aerobics or steady state exercise. That was very much viewed as the enemy and everyone involved in the movement was of the mindset that there was exercise and there was recreation and there was nothing else in between. And that anything that wasn't his definition of exercise was wasting resources, wasting precious recovery resources on something non-productive. At the same time that I was doing my deep dive, Mike Mincer, who had disappeared off the scene after his loss at the 1980 Mr. Olympia contest, reemerged. Um, he had had years of difficulties with uh, some mental health issues and some drug abuse issues, and he reemerged, came back on the scene as a personal trainer. And this is a first article in Muscular Development Magazine by Peter McGuff about him coming back and his experiments in personal training. And his experiments were very heavily weighted on figuring out what is the absolute minimal effective dose for exercise. How little can you do so as to deliver the stimulus with the least amount of volume necessary so that you left the most recovery available. And this had also a very profound effect on me. And what I was finding was these volume reductions were 
producing incremental improvements in my progress. Every time I reduced my volume, I would get a new spurt of progress. And I sort of became like the man that watches the tide come in and takes a measurement every 10 minutes, backs off, takes a calculation, and goes, oh my god, the entire city's going to be underwater in a week. I went on this reductio absur ad absurdum type pathway with all of this. Now, just to give you an idea what this looks like, from 1978 through 1995, this is one of my training journals. And this is when I was in Ohio. I was training at Moore's Nautilus. Um, Mr. Moore was another one of the people that made the trip to Mecca to visit Arthur Jones, and he had all of the Nautilus training equipment, including some very rare pieces. Number seven that says V bench was a vertical bench press that was a negative only machine. It had a leg press that would allow you to lift out a much heavier weight than you could ever lift in the positive so that you could do negative only training. But what you see there is um, a workout that is 17 sets long that took a 41 minute duration that I did at least three times a week without fail. And this was through medical school. This was through residency, working 120 hours a week. This is paying back the Air Force the debt of my scholarship, which was a very intense work schedule. And no matter how bad I felt, I stuck with this. As opposed to my workout, this is an upside down bodybuilding routine that I kept in my training journal. And at that time, you can see there were seven movements, and it took me 21 minutes. And that was long for that particular workout because on number two and number three, you can see HTW. That stands for had to wait. That meant some geek was doing curls on the squat rack and getting in my way. Um, so it slowed me down. Um, but this simple reduction in volume woke up an ability to respond and produce progress that I had not experienced for a decade. So I became very enamored with the concept of volume reduction and where we could take it. That really got put on steroids when I finally got proper supervision in my training. Now, we've, I've always had buddies and stuff that would supervise me, but I went to, in 1997, in June, um, I went to visit Greg Anderson, who was a trainer that ran a very, um, a very good high-intensity training facility in Seattle, Washington. And on that trip, he put me through this exact five-set workout um, that had me on the carpet. I mean, I was very impressed with how much stimulus and how much intensity could be delivered in only five sets. And I started to think if I could open my own place, if I could have idealized equipment, idealized protocol, idealized environment, I could pursue this to its logical conclusion. And in November of 1997, I opened uh, Ultimate Exercise. This is the newspaper ad that I took out um, to advertise the opening of my uh, facility in the local area. That's me training a gentleman there um, who was a financial advisor. He turned out to be the most impressive extreme responder to exercise I've ever trained. Um, probably 12 weeks after that photo was taken, um, he had gone from about maybe 165 pounds up to 185, 190. Um, just, I mean, the muscle just exploded on his body. And he was my very first client to quit. <laughs> he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He had to get new clothes. Um, things didn't fit right. And, um, it was the most frustrating thing for me because it's the thing you dream of personally having and someone just throws it away, but that's very typical. Uh, but when I opened the place, again, my, my concept was to make the delivery of the stimulus so efficient 
that it was going to take a very small amount of volume and we were going to allow recovery to transpire in our clients until we could produce progress demonstrable on the workout card on every set of every exercise, every session. That was our goal. And that was sort of an experiment that took course over a year and which prompted me to self-publish this um, embarrassing little book that maybe some of you might have read. Um, but during that period of time, we were religious zealots about high intensity training, that the stimulus be delivered as efficiently as possible, and that the recovery period was sacred. There was going to be no disruption of the recovery period. We wanted our clients to be um, completely at rest during that period of time. We strongly discouraged any other form of exercise um, to a religious degree. I mean, and there were other facilities in the country that was doing this. I know Andrew Bay, Andy Bay, who trains clients in Florida, tells a story of seeing one of his clients jogging down the sidewalk and pulling his car in front of her and blocking her and driving her home because that sort of activity was counterproductive. I mean, this is how insane we were about this. And it was what we were trying to enforce in all of our clients. And I'm here to tell you, it was a massive fail. It was almost as if they were doing it to be defiant specifically to me of what it felt like because they went crazy. I mean, the, I had clients and they come in and it's like, oh, I ran a 10K for the first time and I won. And I'm like, what are you doing? It was, it was maddening. Um, so this is what I envisioned for my clients between workouts. I really wanted to deliver the stimulus and then you just go and rest and we're gonna have progress on every set and um, I'm going to have this small town of muscular freaks. Um, and this, this is really what I wanted. And I, it's, in retrospect, it was not far from this, but this is what I got instead. <laughs> My clients went absolutely crazy with activity. They could not be restrained from all of these, what I perceived to be unnecessary, extracurricular, non-productive, recovery-wasting activity. And I fought it, and I fought it, and I fought it, and I lost. And in so doing, I started to make a realization about something peculiar about getting clients to a certain level of strength. Now, one benefit we had from being so religious and so anal retentive about this whole process, we had good workout records, good workout cards. And what we saw is once a client on their record, on any given constellation of movements, got somewhere between 25 and 40% stronger, suddenly something happened they became very, not just active, but hyperactive. Even sitting in a chair, they would be restless. Um, they would not wait on an elevator. Um, they took up all sorts of activities from their youth that they had long since given up. Um, these things became very evident, very obvious to me. And over time, this was occurring concurrently with there being a big movement within the field of medicine and within the field of exercise physiology that you need to get up and move, that movement is important, that just the simple activity of being active confers health benefits. I'm drawing this because the way I reconciled this conflict in my mind between what I wanted my clients to do and what they were actually doing was I had to say, golly, I, I'm giving these people a Lamborghini and I'm saying you can only drive it in a school zone. And that just wasn't fair. We had to be doing this for something. It had to be benefiting life. 
And I started, particularly in my middle age and older clients, and especially my elder, elderly clients, I started to realize that what we were giving them, a lot of people, was we were giving them their life back. They got to do things that they wanted to do that they could no longer do. Um, so you have to say, it's okay to take the Lamborghini outside the school zone, but you also have to realize that you're gonna have a Lamborghini, but if the engine in it doesn't allow this car to go as fast as advertised, there's no point. What we're really after is that engine, and muscles are that engine. And it's my belief that, and it's a belief I developed through this process, is that there's something within skeletal muscle that triggers this um, spontaneous increase in activity um, that creates this NEAT, this non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which I believe is a faulty concept. It's thinking that as you become more active, you're more thermogenic, you're burning more calories, and therefore your body composition is changing. That didn't fit with me. I felt as if there is something in skeletal muscle that is within the DNA. It's an active genotype that once you activate it, that um, something seemingly magical is taking place that is outside any parameters currently defined by the scientific literature until recently. Um, and speaking of literature, it's during this period of time that I also got together with John Little and we wrote Body by Science. And I take this little detour here just to tell you that at the time this book was written, it was the first time that the book could have been written. Over the course of five to ten years, I had the son, a college student, um, of my emergency department director when he was in high school and on up through college, I was paying him to scour the literature and find me every relevant article on high intensity training and its effects on health in any parameter or angle that he could find. And I accumulated it all in a big accordion file. And those were the articles that served as the basis for Body by Science. But we have to understand that from the time of Arthur Jones all the way up until 2009, all of this was being done empirically through empiricism. We we're saying, this is what we see, this is what we see works, therefore we're sticking with it. And all, not only was there not scientific literature to support that, and Werner can attest to this, all of the scientific literature was in direct opposition to that. And not just in direct opposition to that, but openly hostile to the entire concept. But only because there were researchers young enough to have heard these arguments and say, I would like to test that. Only because of that, enough time passing, were there researchers like these gentlemen here and, and Jürgen taking up the torch and saying, let's test this and finding out that yes, Arthur was right. There, there's a lot that's correct about this. And I mention this now in, in regard to the book because there's more and more literature that's accumulating to say there is something magical going on within the musculature that produces um, health benefits that seem well outside of the tissue being trained. So the beginning of my talk was, which is it, HIT versus the Fitbit? Right now, there is this incredible meme in society that getting a threshold level of activity will confer all of these health benefits to you. And I'm not here to tell you that doing that, that it's not. But what I do believe is that what we may be seeing is a reversal of cause and effect. The people that walk 10,000 steps a day are not healthy because they're walking 10,000 steps a day. You're having an observational bias going on. People that are healthy 
tend to be that active organically and spontaneously. People that are healthy tend to walk 10,000 steps per day. But the converse is not necessarily true. You cannot take a person that is unhealthy, that does not have adequate muscular strength and function, and make them go on a 10,000 step march every day and turn everything around for them. There will be some improvements, but because the intensity level of that activity is not high enough, you're not really going to produce the adaptive changes that are going to make that kind of activity level um, occur spontaneously and organically. And I think that's the real marker for an improved health status is when you start to see in your patients and your clients a spontaneous occurrence of that kind of activity level. Now, as we do this, having learned my lesson on the whole, you know, resting completely between workouts and how well that went, is that it's important not to try to ram a square peg into a round hole with all of this. We must fit our theories to our observations and not try to force our observations into our theories like I did all those years. So, I'm speaking to a room full of scientists, and I'm sure they're going to ask me, so what is the evidence for this? And I gotta say, there isn't any yet. But there are researchers here today whose presentations have the evidence in them. The evidence has just not been tested in a way that definitively answers the question. So the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. We didn't all just evaporate on 2012. So where do I think the evidence is gonna be found? I think it's gonna be found in myokines. And uh, we will have speakers throughout the conference speaking on this topic, but I think it's going to be um, the linchpin piece of evidence that brings what we do to the forefront as a major public health initiative. And I, I don't want to tread on anyone else's lecture topic because it's going to be dealt with much more eloquently than I ever could, but myokines are just simply proteins and chemical messengers of the cytokine family that are released from skeletal muscle during contraction and during exercise that send out signals. And this is where the concept of NEAT, of non-exercise activity thermogenesis, and where the concept of calories in and calories out falls apart. Health and body composition are not, in my opinion, a matter of calorie accounting, calories in and calories burning. There's not a little accountant in a short sleeve shirt and a black tie sitting inside of your body keeping balance of it all. It's signaling. It's signaling coming from skeletal muscle, going to other places, saying what's necessary. Movement is the underpinning of all health. If you can't move from an evolutionary biological perspective, if you cannot move, you cannot get food, and you cannot keep from becoming food. It's as simple as that. So all these mechanisms are in place to um, ensure that. And there's categories of effects of myokines, and I won't go into them in great depth here. Um, there are ones that affect growth, metabolism, and repair of muscle. There are effects on insulin effects on fatty acid and glucose metabolism, effects on adipocytes or fat cells, and there are non-myokine effects. So under growth of metabolism and repair, there are listed there just three of the different myokines. There's myostatin, which everyone is probably familiar with by now is the growth and differentiation factor eight. 
that's a negative regulation or negative regulator of skeletal muscle mass. It puts a governor on how much muscle will grow, and its withdrawal or down regulation results in increase in muscle size. There's also a myokine named musculin. It's actually induced by insulin. It contributes to insulin re resistance by uh, inhibiting glucose uptake and glycogen synthesis. Uh, it's inhibited by a stress sensing factor within the skeletal muscle. So it's also a negative regulator, so it's a removal of that kind of um, stimulus. Um, so you have things that directly affect muscle mass, and those are kind of always the things we've been focused on. But in terms of human metabolism and health and the diseases of modern civilization, this is where skeletal muscle effects really shine. Um, the biggest component of the metabolic syndrome is loss of insulin sensitivity. Um, and over time, that loss of insulin sensitivity results in the disease states of modern diseases, type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis, uh, systemic vascular inflammation are all driven by this drop in insulin sensitivity. Um, so there's IL-6 or interleukin-6. Um, it works actually directly on the beta islets of insulin-producing cells in the pancreas. Through several intermediaries, it promotes insulin release and sensitizes the cells to glucose. Um, Interleukin-1-beta also increases insulin sensitivity. Um, there's myokines that affect fatty acid uptake and glucose metabolism, predominantly in the liver. Um, but as muscle becomes better conditioned, these myokines become more prominent. Um, you have myokines like myonectin, secreted by oxidative fibers in the skeletal muscle, so more endurance-related fibers that um, respond to glucose uptake and fatty acid uptake in the hepatocytes. Others that um, inhibit insulin resistance in the, form in the formation of obesity at a given level of calorie intake. Um, so regardless of the energy balance, production of these myokines creates um, a state where nutrient partitioning occurs that is more favorable for nutrients to get shuttled to skeletal muscle than to body fat. And I think at this juncture it's point, important to kind of have a conceptual framework in our mind. Um, and uh, Arthur Devaney was the first one that planted this seed in my head, is that we all think of the tissues in our body kind of cooperating in this um, synergistic fashion for our best interest. But it's not really true. They're all encoded by the same DNA, and they are in competition with one another. Your body fat is in competition for nutrients against your skeletal muscle. Your body fat secretes inflammatory cytokines that are in direct opposition to the anti-inflammatory cytokines or myokines secreted by skeletal muscle. So to the extent that one versus the other is favored, you're setting the stage for body composition to be more oriented towards leanness or obesity, irrespective of a stable caloric intake level. So there's much more that meets the eye than just simple caloric balance. Then there's the effect on the fat cells themselves. Um, there are certain myokines that promote lipolysis. When you are performing intense exercise, you can either drive glucose down the glycolysis cycle to pyruvate, which then gets moved into the mitochondria and oxidized to produce more energy to drive the exercise process. But you can also mobilize fatty acids out of the adipocytes, enter at a different level, in the mitochondria and undergo beta oxidation and produce even much higher levels of energy. And there are myokines that pr promote the mobilization of body fat from adipocytes to be burned as energy during intense exercise. And there are many people that can attest to the fact that once you become obese, um, or even if you gain a little bit too much weight, 
It feels as if the very air that you breathe gets converted into body fat, and no matter how hard you work, that you can't burn that body fat off. But what you will find is if you can take a client and you can get them to a certain threshold of strength improvement, all of a sudden that relationship flips and the body fat seems to come off much more easily at a given caloric level. The calorie level didn't change. The response to caloric restriction changed dramatically and it changes when you get across a certain threshold of muscle strength. Once you reach that threshold, that competitive advantage is tipped in the favor of skeletal muscle. So there are other myokines listed that improve fatty acid oxidation, um, that are receptors that amplify the effects of these myokines, and also there are myokines that um, promote the conversion of white fat to brown fat. And really, the only difference between white fat and brown fat is the nature of the mitochondria within them. And in brown fat, what you have done is you've done what's called uncoupling. So rather than the mitochondria using the energy produced in the sequential steps of oxidation to formulate ATP uh, to be used in the uh, mechanical activities of the body, instead of doing that, you uncouple the oxidative phosphorylation. You're no longer phosphorylating ADP to ATP, but instead simply throwing that energy off as heat. And that's used as a survival mechanism. We are all descendants of people that survived three different ice ages. Um, but it's, um, it's a major way in which um, the, the battle against obesity um, is made much, much easier. Um, and finally, there are non-myokine effects. There are other metabolites that circulate around that profoundly signal to other tissues in the body to behave in a way that is different. Um, there are direct neural links between the motor nerves and the motor centers in the brain um, that open the gateway for adaptation to exercise. So there are all these positive feed-forward effects. And um, there are effects on the hormonal status, which we used to think was a very big deal, which now is becoming to seem like less of a big deal, but hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, and gonadal axis all have these complex feedback loops between growth hormone, cortisol, testosterone, and whatnot. But one of the most profound things that strength training does is the peripheral effects. And uh, Jurgen spoke of this, and it, he had an absolutely brilliant test for the outcome of an exercise protocol, and that was to take his elderly subjects and have them walk up the 177 steps in his building and then take their pulse at the end. You see, when you do any given type of work, what you're doing is you're recruiting motor units out of your muscle. A motor unit is those fibers innervated by a single motor neuron. And each motor unit will have a given degree of strength. And depending on what that strength is, that determines how many motor units you have to recruit to do a given activity. So if Jurgen's clients doubled their strength, when they first walked up those 177 steps, if arbitrarily we said every motor unit had one unit of strength, and we let them go up, and then we measured what the effect on their body was, if at the conclusion of this study they were now twice as strong, in order to accomplish that same task, they now only had to recruit half as many motor units. As a consequence, all of the support that had to be received from the cardiac system, the vascular system, the respiratory system, those all only had to work half as hard if you only had to recruit half as many motor units. So just irrespective of all the myokine effects, there's still the peripheral adaptation that when you've got a bigger motor, 
you have to recruit less of it to do any particular activity of daily life. And for your healthy client, um, that's probably the most profound effect, is how it affects their daily functioning. One of the most common early appreciation that we get from clients of what we're doing for them is we'll have a female client, for instance, come up and say, the other day, I went shopping, and I reached into the, without thinking about it, reached into the shopping cart, pulled out a 50-pound bag of dog food and put it into the boot of the car with one hand. And I had to stop and go, did I just do that? Those are the sort of things that make a major difference. Um, and I think that we are at a very critical inflection point right now where the scientific literature is going to show the underpinnings for what you all do as being the major public health initiative that is going to save our society. Um, and I gotta tell you, our society needs saving. Things are much, much better here in Europe than they are in the United States. Um, when we were taking our museum tour, Gabby, I, I broke off for a second. And remember they brought all the school children in for that tour? I had to break off and take a photo to text to my wife. Because it was the first time since the 1970s that I saw an entire elementary school class of children without an obese child in the whole class. It's probably between 60 and 80 percent obese in the United States. It is much worse there than it is here. And um, from a public health standpoint, we really do need saving. And I think you guys are going to be the ones that do it. And I appreciate your attention. Wir haben jetzt wieder die Möglichkeit, ein bis maximal drei Fragen an Dagmar Goff zu stellen. Ja, hallo, Denise Gennig ist mein Name, ich bin auch Ärztin. Und ich hätte eine Frage, ich sage so, diese ganze Geschichte mit den Myokinen und gerade die positiven Auswirkungen für die Kunden mit Zivilisationskrankheiten, die sind uns bekannt. Ich hätte die Frage, wie Sie diese Kunden motivieren, sich mal so anzustrengen, dass sie das Training auch weiter durchziehen. Also ich sage das jedes Mal in der Trainingsberatung, welche guten Vorteile das alles hat und erlebe aber immer wieder viele Kunden, nicht bereit sind, die nicht bereit sind, so intensiv zu trainieren, dass sie von diesen positiven Effekten profitieren. I understood all that. Yeah, I. So. <laughs> so, so, so the question is: a lot of, of medical doctors, GPs, they know the whole story about um, about myokines. Um, yes. And the question is: how do you motivate people not just to start but to stick to the exercise protocol? <sighs> Thank you. Next question. <laughs> I guess the real answer is I don't. Um, in my personal training center, I think we have a retention rate that's probably higher than 95%. Um, I think one of the keys is to get them through the door, and there has to be something out there that draws them in. And, and a lot of places, it's just simply seeing someone that looks to be in good shape and someone asks, what do you do? And then they say it and they show up. Um, per, hopefully that the writing of a book will start to draw in enough people. But once you have them, um, there are two real keys. The first is at the outset, you have to sit down with them and have an introductory session where you explain the intellectual underpinnings behind the approach that you're going to take. Because the performance of high-intensity exercise invokes 
instincts to try to avoid that kind of discomfort. And unless you have an intellectual understanding of the process and why we're doing it, then that person's going to stop before they reach that productive level. So they need that intellectual understanding to be able to override their own instincts to quit in the acute phase. Immediately after that, you have to take them through a demonstration workout because the short volume and how infrequently it's done, most people will not buy into on face value. But once they've experienced even that first set, then they understand. It's, there's an aha moment. Then, once you've succeeded at that, I think you only have to stay on them on the upfront for four or six weeks. I think if they do it properly and you can train them hard enough, by the time they get there, they will never go back. And if they leave you, they will come back because they'll miss what you've given them. So I, I think that's the key. Thank you. And it's right, if it's okay. Doug, my name's Tim, I'm from Australia, and as you're probably well aware, Australia's now a nation of overbeast, overweight people with diabetes, yes. uh, increasingly so. Uh, you described before that society's an inflection point, and, and I hope Australia is. What is the, the study, or, or what is the shift, do you think, that's going to take us from where we are now, where people are carrying their Fitbits and counting their 10,000 steps, uh, to the position that you described? Um, I am hopeful that the research on myokines will come to the forefront. Now, like most research, the focus on myokines initially is going to be how we make a pill out of this, man. <laughs> Everyone wants an exercise pill. Um, but I'm hoping that in the process of trying to do that, and I know this with certainty, is that that will fail. Because trying to get a pill of interleukin-6 or interleukin-15 is not going to work because the action of myokines is very context-specific. Okay. Um, some of these myokines are involved in macrophages during cytokine storms and inflammatory responses that are very negative things. So it's very context-dependent how these behave. So the initial research, I predict, will be trying to find a pill of these different myokines. But in the process of seeing how that fails, I think they're going to understand the enormous power that's built in to skeletal muscular activity and skeletal muscle function as it relates to the overall health of the organism. And that if that's addressed, all these other things will just fall by the wayside. That's what I'm hopeful for, but just the very knowledge of myokines and that they exist is a major turning point to move away from the Fitbit because you can see in these studies at completely equal energy levels that the health outputs are completely different and that the body composition outputs are completely different, that it has nothing to do with the caloric accounting and has everything to do with the signaling. And I think that's going to be the key for making this transition. Thank you very much, Thank Doug you. McGough. It was a pleasure to have you here, and I'm sure we pleasure will follow you and your wife, Wendy, on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. Thank you.